Dr. Friedman, if you were advising uh, President Carter, would you advise him to work through the uh, Federal Reserve or through Congress to implement uh, your recommendation? Well, I'm not sure those are different, and I'm not sure it's really President Carter to work through them. You know, the President has a lot of influence but very little power. The President does not pass the appropriation bills. The President has no direct control over the Federal Reserve printing press. The real source of power in this respect are the Congress and the Federal Reserve together and jointly. And I believe that's where the public at large has to bring political pressure to bear to produce the right kind of policy. So we need to change Congress to get off the treadmill. No, we don't need to change Congress, excuse me. You know, people have a great misunderstanding about this. People in Congress are in a business. They're trying to buy votes. They're in the business of competing with one another to get elected. The same congressman will vote for a different thing if he thinks that's politically profitable. You don't have to change Congress. People have a great misconception in this way. They think the way you solve things is by electing the right people. It's nice to elect the right people, but that isn't the way you solve things. The way you solve things is by making it politically profitable for the wrong people to do the right things. <laughs> you said rather optimistically, I think, that you have detected a trend wherein the public will accept a slowing down of the rolling of the printing presses. I confess that that trend is invisible to me, and I wondered what evidence of it you have seen. I was really not referring directly to a trend to slow the printing presses, but a more fundamental trend in people's ideas and attitudes toward the role of government. Ten years ago, twenty years ago, it was widely taken for granted that there was hardly any problem, the solution of which did not reside in Washington, did not reside in throwing more money at the problem. Very few people believe that anymore today. People are greatly disillusioned about what government can accomplish. In the more particular area you're describing, worldwide, and not merely in this country, the public at large has shifted its major emphasis from unemployment to inflation. It is not any longer politically popular to reduce unemployment by creating inflation. If you take a case like Great Britain, which has in some ways been on the forefront of this, 10, 20 years ago, it would have been said that it was absolutely politically intolerable to have had rates of unemployment of the kind that Britain has had. But today, the Labour government in Britain finds it popular, politically popular, politically profitable, to put its emphasis on reducing the rate of inflation. In Britain, last September at the Labour Party conference, Prime Minister Callaghan found it politically profitable to say, we used to think that if you had unemployment in a recession, the way to get out of it was by spending more money or cutting taxes. But if that was once a solution, it is no longer an option open to us. I'm not quoting precisely, but the sense of it. He said, because we have learned that that only works temporarily, but the ultimate result is more inflation. So you have in Britain and in other countries around the world a willingness on the part of the population at large to to stand for measures directed at reducing inflation. The same thing is true in this country. Every public opinion poll has shown that inflation is a problem that the public at large is more concerned about than the problem of unemployment. It will not be. You see, I think uh, President Carter faces a real dilemma at the moment with respect to his own election prospects in 1980. Uh, he cannot control, I said before, he has much influence but little power. He cannot really control it, but suppose he could, what should he do? He's facing a dilemma. Ten years ago, the answer would have been obvious. Step on the gas, print money, create a great period of prosperity by 1980. But with double-digit inflation, the double-digit inflation will do him more political harm than the boom will do him good. So I think there is a very strongly detectable change in the attitudes of the public at large. On the one hand, 
they are more inclined to attribute the inflation, the responsibility for inflation to government and to be more conscious of it. And on the other, they have less rosy views about the power of government to cure all ills. Thank you very much. Professor. Let's have some more people come up here to increase our inventory of, in process. Professor Friedman, with the federal government's ability and willingness to produce unlimited amounts of money, what are the implications for the concept of a vital local and state government? And the broader question, the implication for the concept of federalism. Well, obviously, one of the trends that has been reducing the viability of local and state government has been a trend toward centralization, a trend toward enhancing the power and the strength of Washington at the expense of the State House and of City Hall. And no doubt, the fact that Washington possesses a printing press and uh, the City Hall and the State House do not has been a factor that has been contributing to that. But again, we come back to the same question that has come up before. Will that continue? Is that necessary? Is it inevitable that the federal government will grow in power? If it is, if it does, then I agree with you. Then we're headed, we would be headed toward a uni unified, centralized country. I think one of our great strengths as a country is precisely the federal system, precisely that we have a distribution of power, that we do have states which, attract, which attach loyalties to themselves, which have independent power. So I think there is a trend in your direction, but I don't think it necessarily needs to continue or necessarily will continue. Of a government agency, do we do ourselves a disservice by uh, quickly pursuing federal grants and funding to meet our needs when often those grants are not our priorities but just where we can get matching money? Well, the, you have a dilemma there. Given the program, given that there is a federal program, I can't blame you for trying to go get it. And yet, I think it sooner or later the public will wake up to the idea that they really aren't doing themselves any favor by sending a dollar to Washington and getting 80 cents back. That's been, been the experience. What we have had, it's, 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 a, uh, it's, it's a great defect of the centralization. Uh, and it's very hard to understand why people allow themselves to be fooled. But somehow, they have the impression that if the money comes from Washington, somebody else is going to pay for it. But of course, it's a two-way trip. And there is a discount taken off in Washington as it turns around. I don't know if I can ask one more question, but since I deal with high school students and I'm concerned about economical education in our schools, what is your barometer as you talk to young people? Uh, what is their projection of the business economy? I deal with many people, young people, who go into government thinking that that's where the jobs are, and that concerns me. What is your... Forecast. Well, at the, again, that is not preordained. We're masters of our own destiny. That depends what we as a people decide. If we as a people decide we want to continue on the path we've been going on, which I hope we won't, but if we do, well, then your youngsters are better off going into Washington. They will get better salaries. Do you know, do you people know what the highest income, average income county in the United States is? It's not... It's not San Diego County. It's not even Marin County. It's not Westchester. It's not any of those fancy Connecticut counties. It's Fairfax County in Virginia, the bedroom of the Washington civil servants. That's the highest average income county in the country. So that you would be telling the students right if you said to them, that if you want to make an income, go to work for Washington. But it's up to us as citizens to make that no longer true. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Right. Recently, yes, we've uh, heard that the in inflation currently experienced in this country won't respond to monetary restraint because it's cost push inflation and not demand pull. What uh, re response would you have to that analysis, if any? It's, a, it's another example of the people who produce the inflation finding this, of trying to find scapegoats for their own deficiencies. Of course the inflation will respond to monetary restraint. 
There is no such thing as cost push inflation, except in the form of the delayed effect of monetary inflation. If you have a monetary inflation that starts to push up prices, it tends to hit retail and wholesale prices first, the prices you and I pay. It's only later that it works its way through costs. But then costs fall behind prices, and there's a makeup period. And during that period, you have what looks like cost push inflation. But there has never been an inflation in history that didn't respond to monetary restraint. If you look at American experience, it responded to monetary restraint. If you take that roller coaster I was telling you, on each occasion, the slowdown in the rate of inflation was preceded by a slower rate of monetary growth. And you have much more dramatic examples of that. Most dramatic example from American history of how inflation responds to monetary restraint was one that was once dug up by a student of mine when he was writing a dissertation on inflation in the Confederacy during the Civil War. And in the later parts of that war, you know, the South financed the war almost entirely by printing press money. And the rate of inflation during the Civil War in the South, I don't know, got up to something like 4 or 5% a month or more. But at one point in the later part of the war, the Northern Army overran the place in the South where they were printing money. And for two weeks, the printing presses couldn't operate. And lo and behold, within two weeks, the inflation stopped. <laughs> And you've got many, many examples like that. So that what you can say to people is they're kidding themselves. Yes, sir. I've been, <clears throat> I've been rereading James of Buchanan on the monetization of the debt. Yes. And his conclusion that we can't possibly reduce the debt because of the depression effects that would result. In other words, we're stuck with it forever. What's your opinions on that? Well, which debt are you speaking of now? Are you speaking of the funded debt, the bonds? The funded debt. The funded debt, we've been reducing it every year. It's much smaller now in real terms, no, in real terms. divided by prices or divided by income than it was right after World War II. And how have we been reducing the debt? By monetizing it, by paying it off through inflation. Now, when you come to the unfunded debt, this $3 trillion or more, of uh, obligations under Social Security and other programs, that's a much more difficult task. I think I may say, if you'll pardon me for a digression here for a moment, that those fiscal conservatives who keep their eye on balancing the budget and on the debt are making a great mistake. And in fact, that they have been the handmaidens of the big spenders. What has happened over and over again is that the big spenders get off and start spending money. This produces a deficit. The fiscal conservatives scratch their head and say, my God, we've got to do something about that deficit. So they go to work and raise the taxes to pay for the deficit. And as soon as they get the budget balanced again, the big spenders are off for the next lap. And the so-called fiscal conservatives have turned out to do the dirty work for the big spenders. As I said before, keep your eye on one thing and one thing only, how much government is spending. Because that's the true tax. Every budget is balanced. There is no such thing as an unbalanced federal budget. You're paying for it. If you're not paying for it through it in the, in the form of explicit taxes, you're paying for it indirectly in the form of inflation or in the form of borrowing. The thing you should keep your eye on is what government spends. And the real problem is to hold down government spending as a fraction of our income. And if you do that, you can stop worrying about the debt. I have uh, two very different questions, but first I wonder if you'd comment on an, <clears throat> an assertion with regard to your theory on the political process. It seems to me that the incumbents who disagree with you and with me are one step ahead of us, and they're so carefully insulating themselves in the political process by giving themselves vast uh, perquisites and benefits of incumbency. So we have people voting for their reelection not on the basis of their policies or their issue positions or their votes but whether or not they're being serviced in their district, which is a vastly different situation than it was years ago. Yeah. Well, that may well be true. I do believe that uh, I agree with you that incumbency is an enormous advantage these days, that the drive, of course, for governmental financing of elections is really a drive to strengthen the power of incumbents and make it more difficult for anybody to challenge them, that the election, the what was a bill that was passed about campaign financing, limiting 
private funds was also a major step toward increasing the advantages of incumbents. But I nonetheless believe that uh, if the public at large feels strongly enough about a subject, Congress will listen and act in accordance with it. And aren't some of the same people feel strongly about this, the same people who are so skinical, cynical and skeptical of the political process, therefore taking themselves out of the voting process? I'm not sure whom you're referring to at this stage. The people who don't vote? Well, I'm talking about we see more and more people becoming disenchanted who believe strongly in the free market, who are just giving up. So no matter who I vote for, the policies continue. And as they take themselves out of the political process, we're left with a proportionally larger well, share of the Well, but others. there's more than one way to make themselves effective. Uh, I understand th your point. And I would say that, I, uh, that the most encouraging move I've seen around is one which started in this state. And that is a move to take the total budget out of the hands of the elected representatives and determine it through a constitutional amendment. That was a Proposition 1 fight that was started here five years ago, unfortunately was defeated. Yeah. It, uh, but I am very much encouraged by the strength which the movement for such amendments around the country and at the federal level is, is, is uh, the strength which it is gaining. As you know, last year Michigan had a similar proposition on its ballot and it was defeated too. It's very interesting to compare the propaganda that was put out in California and Michigan five years apart on the same proposition. It was the same propaganda financed and fostered by the same groups, primarily the State Education Association, making the same kind of misstatements about the, about the, uh, uh, about the proposition, and in both cases with considerable success. But in both those states and in a considerable number of others, there is a grassroots movement that is growing and that I think we, I think we are going to see in the next four or five years at least a half a dozen states adopt tax limitation or spending limitation amendments of that kind. In addition, on the federal level, the Southern Governors Conference a few years ago had a task force which drew up a federal amendment to limit federal spending. Uh, that task force was headed by, headed by Governor James Edwards of South Carolina. Unless I am mistaken, the Gov Southern Governors Conference has endorsed that proposal. There are various congressmen uh, and senators who have introduced similar budget, uh, similar budget limitation amendments in Congress. So I think that there is a strong chance that we have a movement underway which will, and which will give people something to vote for that they think will be effective over and beyond voting for particular individuals. Dr. Friedman, part of the uh, twofold cure you suggested tonight would be a reduction of government spending. What areas of uh, government spending would you suggest are most amenable to reduction? Every area. <laughs> I think that the only way to reduce government spending is across the board. Cut every single appropriation, first year by 10 percent, the next year by 20 percent, and just keep going. You know, why do you, why do you want to choose? No, the reason I ask that is it seems to me that if higher unemployment is a short-term side effect of your inflation cure, then welfare costs are going to go up as a result. Well, that depends on, you see, the problem you're raising is the following one. Every one of us would like to reform a program. But if you try to achieve a reduction in spending via reform, you won't get it. But if you first achieve a reduction in spending through across-the-board cuts, that will force you to engage in the kind of reform you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I quite agree with you. Uh, I don't think we need to spend more money on welfare. Not at all. But if we had a more sensible welfare system, we would spend less and yet give help where it's really needed. You know, the welfare system today does not help the people who really need it. If you take the total amount of money which the government is now spending on programs labeled as poverty programs to help the poor, and calculate how much that amounts to to each person who is designated as poor, it turns out that if they were getting it, they would be among the rich people in this country. <laughs> but of course, they aren't getting it. It's going to lots of other people. So I agree with you that a temporary increase in unemployment, as in the process of curing inflation, might very well cause an increase in some kinds of expenditures 
on the welfare side. But I think that that is not inconsistent with cutting expenditures in general. Also, what is your opinion of consumer protection legislation as it affects economic freedom? Well, most consumer protection legislation is not consumer protection legislation. It's the uh, enacting into the laws of the prejudices of a small group of people who have organized themselves into an effective lobbying group. Is the consumer really being protected by having somebody else decide for him whether he may use saccharin or not? He's not being protected, he's being hurt. You know, the, uh, the most anti-consumer measures on the books that have been taken in recent months have been the, re, the imposition of quotas or their equivalent voluntary restraints on the imports of TV from Japan and of shoes from, I think it was Taiwan. Did you hear any of these consumer protection agencies get up and prote protest about that? Where were they when we really needed them? I think that there's the most effective protection the consumer can get is free competition. If you really want to have a pro-consumer protection move, then you ought, you ought to join yourself with other people in promoting free trade. I have two questions. The first is, how detrimental do you believe the significant increase in petroleum products has been to the rates of inflation throughout the world? Not at all. The increase in the petroleum products has been a negligible cause of higher rates of inflation. It's been an excuse for governments that have produced the inflation. After all, if petroleum prices are a cause of the basic cause of inflation, how can you explain the very different impacts on different countries? Here are Japan and Germany. They both import almost all their oil. It should hit them alike. Germany went through with a maximum rate of inflation around 6%. Japan got up to 30%. The, what happened is that the, not the increase in petroleum prices, but the OPEC cartel and the reduction in availability of petroleum has made, has, has produced a transfer of wealth from the rest of the world to the Arab countries. It's made us poor. To a very small extent, insofar as it's made us poor, it's had a slight effect on making prices higher. But it has had a very trivial effect on the rates of inflation. Second question is, what do you believe the probability might be of the removal of the capital gains tax as well as the removal of the double taxation on dividends? Well, I, th I think there is a possibility that you will move in both those directions, but I think it's very dubious that you will go all the way in either case. Thank you. I may say, uh, I think the more important point about capital gains is not so much about whether it's removed but about whether the base for calculating capital gains is indexed. That's the really important question. It would be well worth paying the price of getting rid of the special treatment of capital gains if you could get the base of capital gains indexed. Because the problem with ca capital gains taxation now is you're not taxing real capital gains. You're taxing purely paper gains, which simply reflect inflation. That's part of the whole problem of tax in indexation. Right. Dr. Friedman, one more question about tax reform. And uh, one more question is right, because we're coming to the end of our time. We've got one more gentleman there, and we'll try to handle both of these if we yes. can. Uh, Congressman Kemp of New York has yes. a proposal uh, to, for a permanent tax cut. I don't know of how much. Partially an emulation of President Kennedy in 1963, I believe. The idea being that if you cut taxes in times of a slowdown, you'll pick up the economy and perhaps even produce more revenue for the government. Now, given your skepticism about tax reform, is this perhaps one proposal you might endorse? Well, I have long ago concluded that I'm in favor of, ta of reducing taxes at any time under any circumstances for any excuse. <laughs> that that's the only effective way to, to, to exert pressure on government spending. Congress will spend whatever the tax system will yield, plus a good deal more. But that plus a good deal more is not infinitely elastic. There is some pressure on them when it gets large. And therefore, the only effective way, in my opinion, other than these kinds of constitutional amendments I was talking about before, of bringing down spending is to reduce taxes. So as I say, I don't go along with Mr. Kemp's reasons, but I'm in favor of cutting taxes. Okay, many thanks.
Yes, sir. <clears throat> I am associated with the banking system, and I do I have won't a, hold that against you. I, I do have a line of credit, and I can <laughs> go... This relates to M2. I could go in tomorrow and sign a piece of paper. The bank will write out a deposit ticket, thereby the money supply is increased. How do you stop that? Oh, no. The bank will only be able to do that if it can find the reserves. And for the banking system as a whole, one bank can always get reserves from another bank. But the great mistake that everybody makes about many different items, it's not only this, is to confuse what's true for the individual with what's true for the society as a whole. The most fascinating thing about economics, the reason, you know, in a way, it's always an interesting thing about economics. It's the most trivial subject in the world. And yet, so many people misunderstand it, and it's so hard for people to understand it. Why? I believe a major reason is because almost every interesting economic proposition has the following characteristic. What's true for the individual is the opposite of what's true for everybody together. It looks to you as if you can decide how many pieces of paper you carry in your pocket, how much cash you have. It looks to you as if you can decide how much deposits you have. It's true, you can. But to everybody together, it's a game of musical chairs. The Federal Reserve determines the total quantity of money, and then it's shared out among the people. Your bank can increase its deposits by attracting reserves away from another bank, but that puts pressure on another bank to contract. The total amount of reserves will set a limit to it. Let me give you some other examples. It looks to you, it looks to the, uh, it looks to you when you go to the store and you see an object offered for sale as if the price is fixed and the amount available to you for you to buy is indefinite. If you want to buy two pairs of shoes at that price, you can buy two pairs. Three pairs, you can buy three pairs. To the whole country together, there are a certain number of pairs of shoes available at the moment. And the price is what's free to move up or down to equate the number of pairs of shoes people want to buy to the pair available. You try this out. On almost every proposition, what's true for the country as a whole is the opposite of what's true for the individual, and that's equally true with the proposition you're presenting. Who gets there first, then? What's that? Sort of depends on who gets there yes, first. Yes, it does. Yeah. It does very Thank much you. so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.